Welcome to Wheels, Deals, and Meals, where we talk all things good food, good business, and good cars. And now, here is your host, Arnold Gasita, founder and CEO of Petra Automotive Products. Let's roll. Well, as you guys know, we are we are still at this event, the Eblis launch at this beautiful Elliott Museum, and we had Pat Cunan with us, who um, you started your love for bikes. If I read your bio right, at twelve years old, 12 sweeping years old. the store of a bike store, sweeping the floors of a bike store, or something like that. Something like that. All so, right, so tell me that story. So part of my life, right? So I went to a, an elementary school that if you lived on this side of the street, you parked at the bike shop. So I parked my bike at the bike shop, crossing guard took us across the street, so I went to school and I hung out at this bike shop every day and asked them for a job every day. And finally, when I graduated from sixth grade, they said, okay. So they hired me to work in this bike shop. So you're 11. <clears throat> I, I'm two days before I'm 12. I say 12 because that's sounds, <laughs> at 65, 12 sounds ridiculous. <laughs> so I wonder what I would do if I lived on the other side of the street because I wouldn't have gone to the bike shop. Right. Because I lived on that side of the street, that's really, you know, what I did. 1970, you know, June 22nd, I, they said yes, and I showed up. That's a great, you know, it's funny because so many stories start by, I'm not going to call it an accident of coincidence. I think they're, they're God moments, right? So you, you, you know, you're parking your bike and you, you get this, you know, opportunity to basically start with what, and we're going to hear more about your career, but what took a lot of your career, you know, in the, in the bike world. Um, you know, I, I too, I sold, I sold freight to a chemical company. 32 years later, I'm in the, I've been in the chemical companies ever since. You know, it's just one of those it is how the, you, you, you knock, on the, you you knock on the door of the right guy and then, and you know, stay. the rest is history, right? So tell me your story, Pat, because I, I know that, that, you know, you have, um, you're, you're very famous for a company that you took from, and correct me if I'm wrong, 7 million to 100 million, right? 7 to 100. 7 to 100 million. And then we merged with a retail company and became a vertically integrated company, and that was a $300 million company. And what was the name of the company? Can you say it that? It was called Ad Advanced Sports Enterprises, but the brands that people would know it by are Fuji and Breezer, Kestrel and SE, iconic brands. We the company was ASI for a long time, and then when we merged with the retailer, we became ASE Enterprises. But when it was ASI, we really internally called it Authentic Stories Inspire because we had these phenomenally historic brands, Fuji, 1899, everyone unique in its category of bikes. So, you know, I just, I believe I that. So the it, ASI is Authentic Stories Inspire. Correct. Authentic Stories Inspire. That's great. So, and we, you know, we had a great run. Unfortunately, the vertically integrated company, we, we didn't make it work. So we took over one of our customers' performance. It had a lot of debt. You know, I thought I had the magic from this, you know, pretty much 18 years of really solid success. And we couldn't, uh, the magic uh, didn't quite work. So we took that company through a chapter 11. The bike part of it still exists the way it did before. But since then, I've been doing, you know, consulting and sort of project CEO work. So tell me your story. What is the Pat story from the day that he started sweeping floors at almost 12 and this, you know, how did you get here? What is your story? Tell me a little bit about your journey. I guess part of it is like the bike business that evolves right so when i started in the bike shop it was not just a bike shop it was a bike shop and a hobby shop because the bike shop as we now know it now didn't really exist yet you know back in the 60s and 70s uh, places like pep boys and goodyear tire stores they sold bikes there were a few bike stores but they weren't formal like they are today so i worked in this store that evolved from you know a general hobby shop into a bike shop but but to answer your story more Specifically, it was a series of, you know, being in that bike shop. I remember, you know, I was there in high school when I would meet the salespeople that came in. I like talked to them about their job and, you know, you get to know them. And it, it was the same story. And I'll repeat it. It's like, well, I can do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I became, you know, worked in a bike shop, w went out on the road as a sales rep for a, a jobber 
calling on bike shops and helping them fix bikes if they needed help in the back. And just then I would meet people that were doing product development. And I was lucky enough in uh, 1979, I was at a trade show when I met John Marino, who at that time had just broken the world record for riding his bike across the United States, 13 days. But I'm like, I could do that. So I, <laughs> I, I made enough money and, and did that in 1979, rode my bike solo across the country. Did and it, it really? was really, yeah. And, but it was those types of things. Like I'd meet, I met. But I mean, how many people can say that? Plenty. Really? Yeah. I had a lot of people in the bike business because it's one of those things you want to do. You know, if you grow Ride up, your bike across country. Correct. So I, I flew out to um, Portland, Oregon, and then rode to Pacific City, Oregon, because I looked at it and said, well, I'll, be, I'll remember if I go from Pacific City, Oregon to Atlantic City, New Jersey. So I just thought, I'll, okay. and I do, I still remember, so it's quite <laughs> a long time ago. Um, but th that was it. So when I got very, very lucky um, working for Ross Bicycles in 1982, I was 22 years old. Hadn't finished college yet. I had a slow process to get through college. It took me a long time. But I was, you know, always sort of jumping around. And I didn't have a lot of money. So I went, went to the trade show in New York where I met John Marino. And this time I went specifically looking for a job at Peugeot, which was just the, the, the brand that I loved the most. But I wandered into Ross Bicycle's booth. And, you know, I just met the folks there. And they asked me about what my background was, and I told them, and they were making the transition from sort of Goodyear and, and um, Firestone Tire Stores into bike shops, and, and this was 1982. And the family was owned, you know, a brother and a sister owned it, and one side of the family did sales, the other side did engineering. Anyway, I'm just there, and the, the family splits. And I'm 23 years old, and I'm offered the national sales manager job for, at the time, the second largest bike company in the United States that was selling to bike shops, Ross Bicycles. And it was involved in product and all sorts of stuff because I was the guy that came out of the bike shop. And I was able to travel to Taiwan and China as early as 1984, Europe, and just w was exposed at a very young age to the entire sort of international bicycle world and at that time, a lot of things were happening. The, the industry had moved, you know, in the 70s, pretty much from Europe to Japan. And then it started to move to Taiwan. And we were a U.S. manufacturer, and I was involved in moving the production, you know, again, I'm like 23, 24 years old, to Taiwan, China, and Mexico. So I just had this phenomenal experience, the family was great. They treated me absolutely like a rock star. Um, and let me do anything. But you know, you say you were only 23 or 24. You started in a bike business when you were 12. So by then, you had 10 years experience, yeah, 11 years experience. Exposure, if not experience. Okay, exposure, but you know. You yeah, I was watching it, paying attention. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. I loved every part of it. And I, and I say this, it's good because, I, you know, we, we, we talk about this in every podcast. To me, it's important that young people realize that that to become a pat, he started when he was 12, right? Paid his dues, worked his way up. So you start when you're almost 12. At 23 and 24, you got a great position, but you also had, as you call it, exposure for 10 or 11 years, and that exposure was valuable. Absolutely. And I, because I was a bike mechanic and a bike salesman on the floor, I could relate to the other employees in the stores. So what happened at Ross, and it's interesting because I know at some point we're going to talk about e-bikes and sort of the, the, the business model that eBliss has, which I'm very interested in. But we developed, so there was a dramatic drop in the bike business in 1982. So there was a bike boom in the early 70s, then there was a BMX boom in the late 70s, and then the market went flat. So sales from... 81 to 82 were 25 percent off and everybody was thinking what are we going to do so as a <clears throat> you know now on the, with the ability to do something we thought well let's make a bike that kids that were bmx that are now adults young adults can ride so we designed and they're doing in california but we designed a mountain bike at ross bicycles 
and our bike was $329, which was a lot because before that, our average retail price was like $120. So we designed this $329 bike. It was a mountain bike. And we were convinced that, you know, all these BMX kids, they're going to buy this bike because this is the next thing for them. And I went, you know, across the country selling this bike. And I, you know, I knew people. I was actually a model. I was a, on the poster for it. So, um, so I would go into these bike shops. I remember this one trip from St. Louis to Kansas City. And we, the first stop is Columbus, Missouri. And we go in and I had met the dealer before. I said, you gotta, you gotta try this bike. Okay. You know, just go away. Just okay. go to the next door. We, you know, we sell about eight of the 12 stops that we go into. They buy the bike. <clears throat> and we told them, this is who's going to buy it. This is what's going to happen. You know, we're bringing these kids back. And I went back three months later and <clears throat> go into the first store in Columbia, Missouri. And I said, so sold it. I said, great. Post band bought it. I'm like, you sold it? Yeah. I don't want any more. Go to the next store. Like four of the stores sold the bike. Nobody bought another one. And I didn't know at that point. You say, well, you won't sell it again if you don't try it. I didn't, I wouldn't, didn't learn that line yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just blown away. The other, one of the other stores I remember, the guy said, well, the guy was in here with his kid buying a bike. He looks at it. He buys it. I'm like, yeah. And that was it. You know, it, it's not like. So, so they wanted kids to buy. They wanted we, buy we designed it for kids. That's who we thought was going to buy it. And young adults and, you know, hippies, you know, that. that and all, and we, all, and all, all of a sudden, 40-year-olds are buying this fat tire bike. <laughs> and it took us years to figure it out. Because. We were, we're, we were in the sports side of the market, enthusiast side of the market, and people were just buying these bikes and spending more than they normally would to buy a comfortable bike with fat tires that they like. So the industry shifted from kids to what are called mountain bikes, but really they were just neighborhood bikes, and it changed the market. So I've always been looking, like, what's next? What's going to happen next? And I've been involved often too early in some of the trends that happened. Or well, my oldest son was going, getting ready to go to college. <clears throat> I was on the college campuses with him, and we're looking at all these bikes that were old bikes, like 10, 15-year-old bikes that were converted into single speed. So they were 10-speed style bikes, but they took the gears off and just made it one gear. And I'm like, oh, we can do that. So my company did a single speed bike at a very low price. It sold you know, very, very well, because we sort of met the market where it was. That was one time when I got it right. It was too, too early. I feel like you got more than one too, thing right. Too early, more than too late. But in any event, so, you know, the, the industry's changed a lot. You know, the way retailers retail have changed, you know, used to be you go to a store. I mean, when I, the first bike shop, one of my jobs was turning the numbers, if you can imagine, like in a deli. Like we had numbers. You came into the store in the bike room, you took a number, you waited till you were called. Some little kid like me would come up and say, what do you want? And, you know, they'd say, well, I want this. Well, it's going to take 30 days. And, you know, there was this demand that we, we didn't understand. So, you know, that was one part of it. And then, you know, the bike market. Sounds like a good part of it. That was a good part. <laughs> Mountain bikes became another sort of boom. And then the company that I worked at for a very long time, Fuji, I started there in 2001, and Fuji was a really historic brand, you know, just a great road bike brand. A lot of people that, you know, in the 70s, their first good bike was after their Schwinn or, you know, that was a Fuji. And that was a time that Lance Armstrong was starting to win the Tour de France, and people were looking at road bikes again, and the bike industry went heavy into road mountain bike things sort of crested, and now road bikes were king. So I got heavily involved in that. We designed phenomenally good bikes. We had a team on the Tour de France. We won the Vuelta, which is the Tour of Spain. So, you know, then he gets in trouble, not quite so popular anymore. The roads are not maybe quite as safe, you know, with distracted driving and all this stuff, and the road bike market 
st started to really, you know, slip way down. Full, full suspension mountain bikes came up, but style of bike called a gravel bike came up. But what has happened is just what people want changes. And, you know, if you're successful, you know when to catch it. And, you know, that's, there's far more, uh, far less science than gut when you decide what you're going to put your energy in. I, I, yeah, I think that's true. I think that's true. I think, but so it sounds to me that you, and, and I know you don't take it, you know, you're, you're being nice and not taking too much credit talking about some of the things that maybe you didn't do, you know, didn't see coming, but you apparently had an eye and an ear for what was happening and the pivot that people should take. Or, you know, the product sometimes meets, you know, a, a requirement. So I, I was <clears throat> playing around with e-bikes to, to sh shift a little bit to that in the um, late 90s before I went to work at Fuji. And I, I was developing an e-bike with a friend of mine. And we just, we never brought it to market because we, it wouldn't, we couldn't get it to really function well. You know, it was a lead acid battery. It was not stable. So we dropped the project. But the other than the battery, you know, it, it was, it's a good idea. They were fun. I had my kids riding them, test riding them for them. One of them broke his collarbone, which probably, I guess, the statute of limitations has passed. So probably, <laughs> can't be charged for child abuse at this point. Um, but the, uh, you know, and, and, you know, we're in this, incredible car museum here it was more than a car museum i was told by the staff it's yeah yeah it's more i was told that too yeah museum, so. Mo motion or something i forget what it was whatever it is I but it, it is beautiful and it's amazing right so you know i'm thinking well you know lee iacocca he got in the bike business 26 years ago so 1997 Which his electric bike is here i saw it that's yeah. what reminded me yeah. and i think it because i knew people that worked for him i worked with some of the people that he hired from the bike industry and, you know, he was right, right? But he was way too early. Mm -hmm. And the technology really wasn't what it is today. And, and a lot of that was the battery. The battery was just too heavy and, you know, clunky. And even the, the materials that were, bikes were being made out of then was not, not as sophisticated as they are today. But, you know, there are many bikes that are just like the bike he made that are still being sold or that are now being sold in big numbers, you know, in, in the U S market for, you know, relatively low prices. They're low tech, but they're functional. Um, so it's just sort of interesting to me that you have, you know, times that are the right time to get into it. Yeah. And I think that's fair. I think there's people that come up with ideas way too early. Yes. Right. It's the right idea, but the people aren't there yet. You know, um, but I think EV, you know, electric bikes, I was talking to Tony in my previous uh, po um, show, people, you know, I mean, I'm in, I'm going to be a little biased because I'm in the automotive chemical world, but people have, have not adapted to EV cars. Even those that tried have gone backwards. The numbers statistically are in there. We're somewhere between six to 7% in the U.S. EV vehicles. Half of those are in California. So the other 49 states account for the other half, right. right? So you, it's just, it's just people have to want it, no matter how great of an idea it may be. When it comes to EV bikes, though, people have no problem, no issue. The time is now. They get it. They're good with EV bikes. They'll go buy that F-150 or Bronco truck and two EV bikes to go along with it. They can, they'll, they'll, they're along with it, right? <coughs> You're right. I, yeah. I, and, and they're not what people in the bike industry would consider cyclists. So the bike shops, the traditional IBD, many of them have been really slow to bring in these bikes, just like they were slow to bring in mountain bikes, you know, because they didn't sell that customer anything. So they didn't, you know, they didn't want to put that kind of thing on the floor. And, and you know, during COVID, they would have put anything on the floor they could get. So there's a, a, sh a mind shift, but it's still not complete. There's a, there's a lot of, you know, people that are bike people that think, you know, putting a motor on, it's not a bike. You know, it's, it, it, what, what, I don't know why they feel that way, but you know, they, they do. 
edit maybe comes through in, in how they've adapted the retail environment for bikes. Now, many <clears throat> specialty e-bike retailers have emerged over the last really 10 years, you know, solidly 10 years, it's been big in Europe and it's been coming here slowly. But because the traditional retail channel didn't really accept it, it's created opportunities for everybody else. But what we're criticized in, with some legitimacy, but I don't really like it, is bike shops can be intimidating, you know, because it's often a lot of really fit, skinny, you know, cyclists that are there ready to They look, they look just to, like me. Yeah, just like you. Yeah, you walk, like, you walk just, into just any like bike me. store in America, they look just like me. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and their, their experience with cycling is at a high level. So sometimes it's hard for some stores, and this is not all stores, uh, to relate to people that really don't know what they want. But they sort of like the idea of electric bikes. They heard about them, they read about them, and they're interested in them. And, you know, that opportunity to sell wasn't taken advantage of completely. So it leaves sort of, I think, an opportunity that, that eBliss has really identified as, you know, people go into car dealers all the time. There's 17,000 of them. Um, they're buying cars. They have kids, you know, and... The idea that, that I've seen is, you know, there are going to be 20, 25 bikes on a dealer's store with a variety of different styles of bikes, expertise available that they're going to train the folks how to, you know, explain how to use the product and, and use it safely. Um, and I think that creates a real market and they already have the stores, they already have the customer list. So it's not like they've got to open a new building. They can make room for it in their store and many have tried it before but they've tried it with like one bike or two bikes and i remember buying a bmw probably 10 years ago and you know i'm in the bike business so they have a bike on the floor i'm like what's this nobody knew you know it's only oh, you can buy it it's you know but it was one bike it wasn't a you know an experience that they were right, looking right. for a bike once right. you, know, you want to have selection and an expert to really talk to you about it so i think this concept takes advantage of something that exists and you know we'll see how you know how how it goes i mean i'm fascinated by it because it just the timing is now yeah and the number of trips by bike you know um like i think 25 percent of all trips in a car are less than one mile right 32 percent are less than three miles. Really? Well, those are good statistics. They're really good statistics. So, it, so it's 28% is, is um, less than one mile. Can you imagine? So if you get half of them, that's a lot. It's that's, a lot less congestion. Major. You know, it's major, and it makes it safer. And at the same time, and I've been involved in bicycle advocacy, not since 1970, but since 1980, being involved in making it safer, and have more places to cycle. So we have a great industry organization called People for Bikes, and it's sort of our... Well, and so as I read up on you, you're considered, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're considered a bike expert. Is that the wrong word? That's what my you... mother, that's what she would say. Well, okay, well, you know. I, I, you I'll, can't I'll, argue with my I, mom. You can't argue with the mom, right? right? Right, but you are an expert. I mean, statistics like this, which... I've been around Bill now for a few months and and love these bikes and have been with them in a couple of um, events. This is the first time I hear these statistics. Well, they, they make a big... That's and big, and, and that's a, those are big numbers. Right? Big yeah. numbers. Big numbers. Because that's what it's all about. And, and <clears throat> it's easier, right? And this is something that a lot of people really don't understand. So they say, oh... The Netherlands, they've always been into bikes. You know, Germany, they've always been into bikes. Not true. The Netherlands decided in like 1972 during the first um, gas crisis or, or, or the embargo, right? Yeah. This isn't working. Cars aren't working. So they, they decided that they're going to make it safer to ride a bike because it wasn't safe anymore. And they're going to make it less convenient to drive a car. So it wasn't like, wasn't planned, 
It was planned. Yeah. You weren't born with the bike. It was right. planned. It was planned. Right. And now it's, you know, the, their numbers are completely different because it's really inconvenient to get in a car in an urban area in the Netherlands and park. To go it's a mile. It's incredibly expensive. And I go to Cape May, New Jersey, and you didn't have to tell anybody this, right? In Cape May, New Jersey, in the winter, you can park anywhere. From Memorial Day until Labor Day, you can't park. So everybody rides a bike in Cape May. And guess what happens when everybody rides a bike? People, the car drivers are aware of bikes. The bikes are aware of cars. It is, it's far, it feels much safer when so many people are doing it. Right. And there has been so much incredibly good infrastructure built. And now the infrastructure that's being built is it's not any longer just a stripe on the road, you know? Yeah, yeah, not just a bike lane. Right. Bike lane. Mm -hmm. Right. Here and, 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 area to, and, and, and places to park it and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And what, the bike share and, you know, all that kind of stuff has made bikes accessible to people um, that they, they just, they weren't cyclists. Yeah, so, so this is the moment. This is the time. It's happening. People are adapted to it. What makes these bikes in your opinion, in your expertise, better than anybody else? Well, these bikes are designed to be um, really pretty much maintenance-free. They have a belt drive. They have, many of them have a, uh, a, a transmission system in them that's not seven gears, 12 gears, whatever it is. It's, it's an infinite number of gears within a certain range. Um, they take a lot of the things that people are intimidated by out of the equation. The maintenance is significantly lower. You know, they're designed, you know, for the way most people ride bikes, right? These bikes are not designed for the Tour de France, right? So right, right, they're right, not right. like the better, but it's that, that I, that's why my mind, like you can't use this in a BMX race or in a jump. These are bikes for how 80% of the people that are ever gonna use a bike are gonna ride a bike on this type of bike. They're not gonna have maintenance issues with it. It's very high quality. The um, testing standards that these go through are at the highest level, same level that they use in Europe. You know, there's issues in New York with um, battery fires from, you know, e-mobility devices. They're nothing like this. These are, you know, really inexpensive products that, that just don't, they're not designed, they're not tested. These things are done right. You, you, you met... Tony Ellsworth. I did. Yeah, we interviewed him as well. Phenomenal. Right, so, you know, that's it. I mean, he's the designer. He understands it. He's been doing it forever. He was doing full suspension mountain bikes in the very beginning. He understands the kinematics of the bike. He understands the electronics of the bike. You know, it, it, there are you know, not a large number of really, really good designers, and he's in that top tier. Yeah, for sure. You know what I also like about Tony? He always carries a wrench in his pocket. That's because you got to do stuff. With you bikes. know, I mean, literally, he got out. He goes, you know, the seat's too high, and he got into his pocket. Here's the wrench. Let's go. Let's no, go he, at it. Let's he, go he's at it. He's a phenomenal guy. I've known him for so, many, many years. So, Pat, tell me this: What is your favorite car? Since we're in here now, moving away a little bit from the bikes, just for fun, what's the car that Pat wants in his garage? If you could blink your eyes, what is the car that Pat wants? So. I have a 1966 Lotus Elan in my garage now. Okay, well, what else do you want, Pat? So I would take, <laughs> I would take that 1954 Corvette, but what I want is a 1965 Corvette Stingray hardtop with the, I forget what the back window is called. Uh-huh. The, the um, teardrop or... I think it is the teardrop, yeah. That's, I know what that's, you're talking about. Yeah. That's, my, that's what I want, 1965 stingray what is your favorite place to travel of all the places you've gone to what is your favorite charleston south carolina really yeah i'm getting a lot of first in this these uh, interviews no kidding why i just love that i mean i really, really don't know why i went there as a young kid i i've gone back many many times i just love and i'm you know not, not to sound no, 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 but no, but i've been no, all over that's why i'm asking but I that's mean, great I, yeah yeah, and um, in the good U.S. of A. In the good U.S. of A. I don't, you know, I had two children graduated from the University of Miami. So I like Carl Gables quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but there's something about Charleston that's just, it's quaint, it's safe, it's fun, it's, you know, wonderful. That's great. Favorite food? How about you? Mexican. 
American Mexican. American Mexican, yeah. Well, oh, I would say Tex-Mex for me. Well, I, 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 I would, Houston, I would right? say, yeah. Think some good fajitas at you know Lupe's yes, or something. Yes, I, like I that. definitely or, or Papa, yeah, tech, Papacitos, Tex Mex. Yep. Um, favorite place to travel for me, you know, my favorite place is Venice. You know, yeah. I mean, I got a lot of favorite places, but Venice is up there. Um, I mean, it's just you know, it's a great place. But the thing about the, the thing I like about Venice is that you can you know, it's all these little walkways and, and aisles, right? It's not like major streets, so you can walk anywhere, stop at any restaurant with four tables. I get the best meal ever. Right. Uh, that I agree. That's, That's the, the food, food in Venice is better, better than the food in Charles. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, one more thing. Anybody ever told you to look like Richard Gere? Yes. <laughs> I won. Because I felt like we should say, you know, we're interviewing Richard Gere. <laughs> so, I, I don't mind that at all. But when I'm in Taiwan, like the taxi drivers, that's who they think I am. Oh, really? Yeah, I have no... You know, there's, there's something about... about I, I, you know, and he, he goes... Over there for whatever well, you know, what's reason. funny is when I go to China, they think I'm Buddha. Well, you got the hat. Yeah, <laughs> and the stomach. <laughs> Pat, thanks for being hey, on, man. It's been great. Thanks, yeah. Appreciate you. Thank, you. Thank you for listening to Wheels, Deals, and Meals, your main source for all things good and fun, business, food, and cars. If you like this episode, make sure to rate us and subscribe. If you would like to be a guest on our show, please leave a message at the link below. Till next time, happy eating. Hey, we're here at the Ilion Museum filming a bunch of episodes for you guys. If you like the upcoming episodes or any of our episodes, give us a thumbs up, subscribe, like, comment, share. We need you to be part of the team. Thank you.